Someday soon, my Savior will call out my name. Good evening, everyone. I hope you're ready for a Bible class. I'm glad you're here. Please turn in your Bibles to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. We're continuing in our s series on first things first. And we've talked about thank, uh, 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 salvation by grace. We've talked about uh, security in Christ. We've talked about several things over the last uh, six lessons. And we're going to talk about uh, tonight and next week about a couple more things that I think they are, they are in the first things first category. They may not be the very first thing we bring up to people. They may not be the very first thing that we worry about having nailed down in our own mind because salvation is first and uh, security is second and so forth. But nevertheless, in the first things first list is where is your authority? Look in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and look at the verse that says study, verse 15. It says study. It does not say work. It does not say be diligent. It does not say make your best effort. It says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. If you are instructed, as you are right there in that verse, to study by rightly dividing the word of truth, I want you to think about what you have to have in your hands or in your presence in order to do that. You have to have the word of truth. I want you to look at John chapter 17. John 17. And we're going to jump around just a bit, so try to stay with us. I hope you've got your King James Bible in your hand. I'll get back to that in just a second. John chapter 17. In John chapter 17, Jesus, just before he's betrayed by Judas, is talking to God the Father. He says in verse 17, John 17, 17, easy to remember. The Lord does that hundreds and hundreds of times just for you and me. John 17, 17, he says, sanctify them. He's referring to the 12 apostles. He says, sanctify them through thy truth. Now watch, thy word is truth. Paul told us, you just read it in 2 Timothy 2:15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Jesus said of the word of God, he said to God the Father, thy word is truth. Paul said rightly dividing the word of truth. Now I know we could get a little more specific about 2 Timothy 2.15 and what the word of truth actually is in, in the context but what I want you to understand is, where is the truth? You see, high on the priority list of first things first is, where is the authority? The authority is in the truth. Now, Jesus said, thy word is truth. Go back to John 1. Look in John 1. In John 1, Verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus said to the Father, Thy Word is truth. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Well, then what is all this Word? What is the Word of truth that we must rightly divide in order to stand approved of God and before God? What is the word that we are to seek out? Notice John chapter 14, I think it is. I'm sorry, John 11. John 11. I'm still wrong. John 14. Verse 6, Jesus saith unto Thomas, one of the twelve, Jesus saith unto him, 
I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now I want you to think about the world you live in and doesn't, that does not believe in this truth. You're living in a world filled with people that don't know where the truth is. They're like Pilate when Jesus said to him about the truth. He, he sneered at him in a sneering way and said, What is truth? Sort of like the time that Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey him? I reckon he found out, don't you? You see, my point about this, folks, is that there has to be a word of God, a word which you can hold on to and say, this is the authority. Well, I've got it on good authority that Jesus said he was the word. John said the word was also God. Jesus is described by in several passages being God in the flesh and on and on. Well, think with me. Rightly dividing the word of truth? Well, then the first requirement would be for you to have the word of truth, would it not? Now, here's our first thing's first subject for tonight. Where is God's truth? Now, I grew up in a home in Indiana that was, let's say, strict. How about that, if we said strict? And my father believed the King James Bible is the Word of God. I don't recall him ever trying to explain to us why the King James Bible was the Word of God. I just don't recall him doing that. And uh, if he did that, I'm sorry to have been slighting him about that. But nevertheless, I don't recall him doing that. But when it came up, when it came up, in my life, after I was saved, by the way, when I was saved, my mother and father sent me, or my mother sent me, one of my father's old Bibles, because she thought it was a, is a Thompson Chain Reference Bible, and she thought his old notes in there would be of help to me. And his notes weren't so much, but I enjoyed the, the Thompson Chain Reference Bible, and that was a King James Bible. And I used it most of the time, although my pastor had told me that I should have a new modern version and that he recommended the New English. Well, I bought one at a hard time. don't think I ever read it as to be reading it. just had a hard time using it. Nevertheless, when I was confronted with where is the Word of God, it was by uh, Brother E.C. Moore who taught me how to study the Bible. And it was in 1974, January of 1974. I had been saved about nine and a half years at that time, almost ten years, and I had just sort of bounced around listening to mostly the King James, but I wouldn't have said the King James was the Word of God because I didn't know it. And one of my friends, when we left Danville, Illinois, gave me a parallel Bible with four versions in it so I could really study. Never could study out of that thing. But anyway, when I was confronted with this, I said, okay, where is the Word of God? I know that the Bible is the Word of God, but which Bible? I know that I need to know where the Word of God is. Do I just take my Father's Word, or do I just take E.C. Moore's Word, or do I find out where the Word of God is? And so I began to study. I began to make comparisons with the versions that I had, and at the time I found out by looking around the house that we had seven versions of the Bible. And so I began to look at them, and things began to show up. I want to talk to you about some of those things here tonight. I want you to look with me, in, if you will, in Mark, the book of Mark, chapter 1. Mark 1. I believe this is a good way, making these comparisons. If you've got other versions of the Bible, you write these verses down that we're going to talk about. If you have another version that you're using, you're going to notice some of these things that we're talking about. And if you're reading out of a King James Bible, but you've got other versions in the house, you can check these things out on your own. This is not hard. This is very simple. It's very straightforward. And it's the word of truth. Jesus said, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Okay? Mark chapter 1, verse 2. It is a reference to John the Baptist. And Mark writes, As it is written 
in the prophets. Plural. Prophets, plural. With an S on it. Prophets. As it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Well, let's see this now. He said, Prophets. And let's see, um, I've got a reference here that says, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face is out of Malachi, chapter 1. And then I've got another one here in verse 3, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, and that's out of Isaiah. There's two prophets, Malachi and Isaiah. Oh, guess what the other versions say? In Mark, chapter 1, verse 2, just about all of them say, as Isaiah the prophet said, and then quote you, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which Malachi said. See anything wrong with that? Your Bible says Isaiah said it, but Isaiah didn't say it, Malachi said it. Now I want to ask you, in the strict standard of writing, is that a lie? If your Bible says, as Isaiah said, and then quoted Malachi, wouldn't that be a lie? In all fairness, isn't that a lie? Would the Word of God have a lie in it? No, I don't think so. Is there a problem with the Bible saying Isaiah said something that Malachi said? Yes, there is. What are you going to do about that? How about the King James? As it is written in the prophets. And then he quotes Malachi and Isaiah too. But if you said Isaiah said it, you'd be lying. So, I've, have, I've pointed this out to people, and they very quickly say, well, I, I, yeah, I have a footnote here that says Malachi said it. Oh, you mean these... <coughs> I'm sorry. You mean these brilliant scholars who wrote all these versions, like the New American Standard and the NIV, the New International Version, or Not Inspired Version, whichever way you want to call it, or the R New RSV, or uh, the um, ASB or on and on and on, all of those versions, do you mean the guys who were so smart they could translate this Bible lied in Mark chapter 1 verse 2 and then put a footnote down there so you'd see they were lying? Why should you think that was a good Bible? Pick up your RSV, your NASV, or your new RSV, or your NASB, or your ASB, or whatever, or the NIV, or the new NIV, or the... 21st century, all those, and see if they lie in Mark chapter 1, verse 2. If it's there in your Bible that Isaiah said something that Malachi was the one who actually said it in prophecy form, why would you trust that Bible? Why indeed? That's a great big test right there, Mark chapter 1, verse 2. And if you slight that, if you think, well, that's not terribly important, think about what you're doing. But let's go on. There's some other reasons. There's some other ways you're going to see this. Look at Matthew chapter 23. Matthew 23. Now, I'm going to hurt somebody's feelings here tonight, and I don't care. I don't mean that I want to hurt people's feelings. I mean that they, you can't stand in the way of the truth over somebody's feelings. If you belong, or you attend, or you think it's okay that there is such a thing as a Roman Catholic Church, I want you to pay attention to this one. The Roman Catholic Church is called the Jerusalem Bible, or the New American Bible, I think it is, or American Catholic Bible. Anyway, they've got about three versions that they say is best. And they have some others, like they will approve NASB and they will approve the NIV. Look in Matthew chapter 23. And if you're looking down through there, and if you have one of these, and you, you be sure you write this down. If you're, not looking, if you're looking at a King James Bible, you write this down somewhere. Look down and see if you have a, another version. See if there's a verse 13, a verse 14, and a verse 15. Or does it just skip from 13 to 15? Most versions do. Just skip from 13 to 15. Let's read verse 14. 
Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore you shall receive the greater damnation. Why would you want to take that verse out? I don't give a flip what kind of an excuse you come up with taking it out. It's in the King James Bible because it's in the received text manuscripts which make up 98% of all manuscripts available. That's right. And it's in there. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses. Who in the world would be devouring widows' houses in the world? How many stories would you like me to tell you about the Roman Catholic Church devouring a widow's house while she was still living in it? Telling them such things as that they need, she needs to give their, that, church to, uh, that uh, house to the church because otherwise her husband is, her dead husband is going to be in purgatory for a long, long time. Don't you tell me they don't do it. I can give you two prime examples. If you write me, I'll give them to you. One of them is in a book. You can get it. It's written by a man named Chenaki, and he's 50 years in the Roman church is the name of the book. You can read it. They devour widows' houses. And then the second half of the verse says, And for a pretense make long prayer. Oh, my. I have shared the pulpit with Catholic priests, monsignors even, in funerals. I've never seen such thing. Going on and on and on, repeating over and over and over the same thing. You listen to their... Uh, they, in Indianapolis, the, when I was a little boy, there used to be a program on the radio called The Rosary. said the same thing over and 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 over. What in the world for? God says that's a great uh, damnation. And for a pretense make long prayer, therefore you shall receive the greater damnation. And why would anybody want to take that verse out? Like the NIV, the NASB many of the other modern versions, why would they want to take that out? Well, how are you going to sell your Bible to a Catholic if it condemns him or condemns his church? 14, verse 14, Matthew 23, 14, not in most versions. Think about it. Is that truth? Yes, it's the truth. The Textus Receptus makes up 98% of all extant uh, manuscripts. Sure in there. Notice, if you will, Luke chapter, ever fo uh, ch ch Luke chapter 4. We're in Luke 4. Look in Luke chapter 4. In Luke chapter 4, I want you to notice something. This is the time when Jesus is going to be tempted by the devil. He's going to be tempted by the devil because he's the Son of God. And he's going to put his trust in his Father. Verse 3, And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it, may, that it be made bread. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Every word of God. Well, Mark chapter 1 verse 2 and Matthew 23 verse 14 would make that a little suspect then, wouldn't they, in some of the modern versions. By every word of God. Oh, by the way, do you have your other modern versions standing by? If not, write down this verse and check out. It says that man shall not live by bread alone. Many of them leave off the last part, but by every word of God. And by the way, Jesus is quoting Old Testament Scripture. It is written, he said. And if you look for it, go hold on there to some... Well, you, don't, you know where you're going there. Go back to Deuteronomy. And look in Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8. You have to pay attention to who you're agreeing with. If you pick up another version of the Bible, you may be agreeing with some people you don't even believe are saved. Deuteronomy chapter 8. 
in Deuteronomy chapter 8, look if you will in verse 3. And he humbleth, and he, blah, 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 and he humbleth thee, and suffered thee to hunger, and feed thee, fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. When Jesus quoted it, he did not fail to say every word of God. He said, but by every word of God. Well, people look back at Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3, and in some weak way of trying to justify themselves not having it correct in Luke chapter 4, they say, well, see the word word in there? It's in italics. That means it wasn't there in the original. Well, then, isn't it interesting that Jesus Christ quoted it with the word word there, and there's no italics in the New Testament you know what that tells you? It tells you that the Lord Jesus Christ, in His spoken word, corrected the absence of the word word back there, which had to be inserted to match the Lord Jesus Christ's words. Isn't that something? Besides, just a note about languages. Now, I'm not a linguist, so don't write me letters about this, but it's very apparent when you read both Greek and Hebrew definitions that it takes more words to describe activity uh, than, than what it does in the English language. You can use less words to describe the, the activity. And so the word, word, had to be inserted there. Now, look, if you will, in Luke chapter 2. Go back to Luke and look in Luke chapter 2. You know, the number one attack from outside of Christendom on the Word of God is not these things that, that we have yet looked at. They just note that the versions of the Bible are foolish and leave out verses and so on and so forth. And I picked on one left out verse there so far. The NIV leaves out 18 of the New Testament verses and the New ASB Leaves out, I'm sorry, the new ASB leaves out 18 and the NIV, the New International Version, leaves out 17 verses in the New Testament. Isn't that surprising? Look, if you will, in Luke chapter 2, the number one thing that the outside world attacks is Jesus, is no, Jesus was not virgin born, Jesus was not the Son of God, and on and on and on. Jesus was just a good guy, he was a prophet, and all that stuff. Notice, if you will, in Luke chapter 2, uh, verse, um, it, it is the time when, when uh, the old prophet shows up, I think his name was Simeon, and he picks the babe of Jesus up in his arms and blessed him, and, and we'll read from verse uh, 29. Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles, and the glory of thy people Israel. Now watch what the next verse says. In the King James Bible, it says, And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Joseph and his mother. It does not say his father and his mother. The Catholic Bible says his father and his mother, and several others do. His father and his mother. Joseph wasn't his father. Now notice, in the passage, the Lord clears that up. The te they tell the story in the same chapter about the time when Jesus went to Jerusalem with, with Joseph and Mary, his mother, when he was 12 years old. And when they start home, they don't see him. They think he's with friends. And now they find out he's not there. So they go back to get him. And they find him in the temple where he was amazing all of the doctors. Amen? Now look, if you will, in verse um, uh, 48. And when they saw him, Joseph and Mary, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou dealt thus, uh, that, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And he said unto them, How is it that you sought me? Wished you not that I, Jesus, must be about my father's business? Telling them, at age 12, something they already knew, 
that Joseph was not his father. They were his parents, and they're called his parents in Scripture. But Joseph was not his father. Now, if you've got a Bible that goes back to verse 33 and makes Joseph out to be his father, then you've just given the world another angle to pound people who believe in Jesus Christ as their Savior. Isn't that something? And speaking of Jesus Christ as your Savior, these versions of the Bible have done an awful lot to build religion. But they don't build salvation-based salvation. They don't build security-based security. And they don't build a a child of God's life into the mold that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit have caused Paul to have written down in Romans through Philemon. Here's how they do that. One of the many ways. Go to Romans chapter 1. Romans 1. First book you come into your Bible that Paul wrote. Not the first one he wrote, but the first one you come to in your Bible. Look in Romans 1. In Romans 1, Paul says in verse 15, he says, So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. Watch verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. What is the power of God unto salvation? The gospel of Christ. Romans uh, 4, uh, verse 24 and 25 says that it's all about He who was delivered for your offenses, but was raised again for your justification. If you believe on the one who sent Him, then you have salvation. Paul said the gospel of Christ is that which will save you, how that Christ died for our sins, was buried, and was raised for our justification. But what if you took the words of Christ out of there? For I am not ashamed of the gospel. Well, could that be the gospel Peter preached? Could it be the gospel that John the Baptist preached? Could it be the gospel that Moses preached? Could it be the gospel that Noah heard? Could it be the gospel that Adam heard? No, it's the gospel of Christ. And it's the King James Bible that tells you it's the gospel of Christ that is the power of God unto salvation. If you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, my friends, you have a Savior. If you don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you don't have a Savior. If you want to know how to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you must hear the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He was raised again the third day according to the Scriptures. If you believe on that, the Lord will save you. If the Lord saves you, you can point back to it because Paul said, I'm not ashamed to preach it. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Why would anyone want to take of Christ off of there? Oh, they don't want to make anybody mad who thinks there's there's only one gospel all the way through the Bible. So to sell Bibles, they take that phrase off there. So that wouldn't matter. Oh, yeah? Check out your religions next door. You know, those 75 or 80 that are in your community. Check out those religions and see what they believe would save you. Not the gospel of Christ, chances are. They're either going to add something to it or take something away from it. Well, Christ did his part. Now you've got to do your part. You ain't got no part in your salvation. You trust Christ as your Savior. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. I thank you for being here tonight and I hope you have a blessed week. See you next week with the next edition of First Things First. Someday soon I'll be in heaven Someday soon